Sir, I'm right. with you. Right. Um, I understand that you were involved in something called the Globe Shakespearean Theatre Group in, in the 30s. Was this the kind of thing that first started you thinking about doing something like this? I, I was involved in the 30s in a, in a, uh, a um, company that performed in a reconstructed Globe Theatre. Uh, I don't know what it was called, I think it might have been called the Globe, the Globe Company or something. But uh, that's when I began my career, in fact, professionally. They had a uh, World's Fair in Chicago and then subsequently one in Cleveland in the Great, Lake, the Great Lakes Fair, it was called, and they reconstructed these Globe theaters and had companies uh, in Chicago Cleveland, and then later on did the same thing in San Francisco and uh, San Diego and Dallas, Texas, and other parts of, of the United States. So I had a, a beginning, you see, in Shakespeare and and the, uh, a reconstructed globe in my early career. But was it as large as the actual globe? I mean, was it a, a real attempt to do it, or was it just an, an open, air, open air? No, no, around? it was a real attempt to have a, a globe uh, reconstruction. Uh, the accuracy of it, I believe, uh, was uh, highly questionable. Um, but uh, I believe the attempt was, uh, was serious, uh, as these things go. Uh, it was a it didn't have an open roof, um, unfortunately, and it had seats in the pit. Uh, so in, that, in those two major respects, it was nothing like what the original globe was, but in terms of its outer shape, and to some extent its inner shape, it, it had certain similarities. And when, did this, when was this project first brought to you? I mean, were you in it from its inception, or were you asked to come in? No, I was a student in a drama school in Chicago, and uh, um, they were auditioning for actors to be in the company from the graduating class. And I went along as a first-year student just to observe the whole procedure of auditions and so on, and uh, found I was thrust by mistake into reading, uh, auditioning, and uh, apparently uh, I was considered good enough to, to be given a job. So that's how that happened. It's quite accidental, in fact. And how did uh, this happen, you know, what you're doing now? Oh, this project? Mm -hmm. Well, this project uh, came about because of that early experience and my early and uh, my interest, which uh, began at a very uh, early period in my career in uh, Shakespeare, the classics, uh, and the origins of the globe. Quite naturally, because I started in my my career in the way I did, uh, I was naturally interested and uh, learned uh, a lot more about it than I would perhaps normally have done. And when I came to England uh, in the late 40s, I naturally came down to look at the site where the original globe stood, and I found this industrial, commercial, derelict, semi-derelict area. Uh, and I was astonished that nothing had been done uh, of any significance to mark the uh, site, not only the globe, but some of the other great Elizabethan theaters that stood nearby in the 16th, 17th century. And I thought, well, it's rather remarkable that in America they had done, made, built several of these globes uh, in the 30s and 40s, and many of them still exist and are operating with uh, great success. And nothing of this kind had been done in, in the land where it was all born and began. Um, and then I, in, over the years, have talked about this to people and said, uh, trying to encourage them and urge them to, to do it based on the success that it had and the fact that academics, scholars, teachers, students, uh, and the uh, mere curious uh, would be fascinated by it such a structure and such a, uh, an opportunity to see plays done in, in, in 
that kind of ambiance. I mean, it had both an educational, cultural, and uh, entertainment value, which is what we discovered in America. <clears throat> but uh, I also discovered that there have been many individuals and organizations over the years, since uh, 1900, in fact, uh, the last uh, nearly 75 years. Uh, quite uh, serious uh, attempts were made to do this thing exactly uh, as we are proposing. Uh, people as distinguished as William Powell, for example, uh, Sir Martin Harvey, uh, uh, to name just a couple of the early greats of the theater in this country. Uh, very distinguished professors like, Sir, uh, like uh, Professor Allardyce Nicol, uh, Tyrone Guthrie, uh, people of that caliber uh, were making attempts all the time to get this sort of thing going. There was one major attempt in the late 30s uh, which uh, included, it was called the Globe Mermaid Association, which included uh, uh, General Smuts uh, as its vice president, it included uh, uh, Herbert C. Hoover, ex-president of the United States, uh, the president of the Midland Bank in London, and many distinguished university professors and presidents from Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard University, Columbia University in America, and so on, all got together in this association in order to do exactly this. The unfortunate thing was that uh, the war uh, was imminent, and uh, stopped uh, any kind of activity of that kind in its tracks because obviously uh, this was not on in a wartime situation. So when uh, about three years ago roughly I realized that this area was all going to be redeveloped and the derelict uh, warehouses pulled down and the major discussions were going on uh, in the GLC for the redevelopment. I mean, the, the London Redevelopment Plan was being discussed. I realized that the opportunity finally had arrived when this could really happen as a practical proposition. And uh, I was challenged to, to see if I could make it happen because apparently nobody else seemed sufficiently interested to actively do it again at this moment in time and I was convinced that it really could happen now but it required a very special effort to do so and uh, because of the poss real possibility, practical possibility of it happening, I felt so strongly about not only the globe, but the whole idea of redevelopment and town planning, I've always been interested in that anyway. And I saw this magnificent, the magnificent potential of the, of the riverside as an amenity, because I've often deplored how badly London had used its magnificent and great historic river, whereas other cities like Paris have made such a use of the river as a place of beauty, uh, whereas here it's always been a dumping ground and a backwater, uh, and people always, you know, turned away from the Thames, or the Thames has been used as a dividing line between North and South London in a very bad way, so you almost have two different cities, in fact. And here was a great chance because it was in this marvelous position with the best views almost of, of, of old London anywhere because it's from this position you can almost repeat the view of London that Fisher and Holler did in their sort of wide views of London and I would suggest you illustrated the, this, uh, this piece in your magazine with uh, one of those pictures because it's really what you see. I mean I can look on that uh, picture and actually pick out the same spires that were in that 16th century panoramic view of London 
from this office, from this window. <clears throat> uh, anyway, because of the great view, because of the potential redevelopment, because the imminence of all this happening here, uh, and because of the sig immense significance internationally that this area has yeah, to the English-speaking world, and indeed uh, throughout the world in other languages, I decided to have a go. And th that's how it all started. So the actual redevelopment idea was, was more something which you brought to the yes. I mean, Originally, they just wanted you to uh, create a new globe. You well, nobody it. wanted me to do anything. <laughs> in fact, the, 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 the biggest effort was to try to stop me from doing something. Um, and you may wonder at that, because when the proposal was put forward, basically at my instigation and the establishment of foundation of this trust, uh, projected a large scheme for the redevelopment of the area, not just the rebuilding of a globe, but the redevelopment of, of, of a mile of riverfront in a certain context which paid homage and respect to the cultural and historical associations of the area. Uh, most uh, people um, thought we were mad and uh, that this was impossible of achievement. It was a gargantuan uh, um, project which had no possibility of fulfillment. And then, so it was ridiculed and, uh, or at least treated with a great deal of skepticism. Um, the local authority had no uh, possible vision of this uh, at all. The GLC had not con contemplated this area in any special way at all. And the private developers that owned uh, or were attempting to buy the land for office development were naturally very hostile to our proposals because it meant a possible diminishment of the profitable development of the area in terms of offices. And so and then the Arts Council and various other so-called cultural uh, support organizations uh, were very concerned, and still are, that the commitments to the new National Theatre <coughs> and the Barbican scheme were so great that this, you know, that they couldn't contemplate another or rival uh, art centre and theatre. Of, uh, on any major scale, so they uh, had a sort of negative attitude. And lastly, of course, there's the latent hostility to a foreigner such as me um, doing anything to, uh, with regard to British culture. I mean, there is a kind of resentment of an interloper. But how has that been expressed? Do you just feel this? Or is that just oh, it's expressed uh, quite a lot in the in the press. I mean, I'm just, as a matter of fact, looking through some papers, and here's a marvelous uh, piece which was written by Simon Jenkins in the, in the Evening Standard a few months ago, a uh, quite laudatory one about the marvelous things that uh, has been, have been accomplished in this area and the great potential uh, that's come about as a result of what we're doing. He ends up his whole piece saying, the real shame is that it has taken an outsider to show us how to do it. Now, that, uh, he doesn't use the word taken an American, but an, an outsider. Mm. <clears throat> and this uh, has been given expression in other forms, one way or another, in, uh, not only in the press, but in conversation. People have said, you know, but isn't it a damn shame that, <laughs> that you have to be doing it? Uh, it's in a way uh, an expression of guilt on the part of the British. <clears throat> that, that's what it reflects, and therefore there is resentment. Not only that a foreigner is coming in uh, to tell them how to do this, or to lead them uh, towards fulfilling something that should have been done, uh, the resentment of that, and the fact that it, 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 it that none of their own 
has been able to accomplish it, or at least promoted it. And here you are going to open the first production of the Sydney Opera House as well. Well, that's more acceptable, you see, in a way, because Australia is uh, more uh, reflects both the cultures of the British and the Americans, somewhere between, you know, and uh, that there is a greater tradition uh, of accepting foreign uh, participation uh, as there is, in, in fact, in the United States and always has been than there is in this country. I mean, this country has a, its tradition is so great and so long and so strong and, uh, that uh, it's very hard to become assimilated into the British, uh, to be accepted, rather. I mean, one could be assimilated, but to be accepted uh, is, is, is very difficult. And you see that in the distinction that still people feel uh, within the, 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 the various countries that make up the Great Britain. I mean, it, you see the hostility to the Irish, to the Welsh, to the <laughs> Scots, uh, that still go on. And, and, and people retain that national identity as very powerful. So how it's not to be, uh, or it's to be expected that they would uh, not be able to accept one of the colonials. <laughs> well, I noticed, uh, I was looking at the uh, Kenneth Tynan book, uh, collective criticism. And it had a review of you in Winter Journey, I think, in 1952, which absolutely praised you to the skies. And then about seven years later, when you were at Stratford doing Iago, and it was the most shattering review. And it does seem as though... But by him? Or by him, yes. 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 Um, because I think he was the one who said this marvelous thing about, I played Iago like a Chicago gangster, which I thought was rather good. He also says something about Iago should be very disarming, and Mr. Wanamaker is profoundly armed. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I remember that. That's very good. <laughs> yes, that's true. Well, I think that's probably true of me, personally. You know, a lot of people feel uh, that, that they've, they've got to protect that, themselves. I always think of, uh, usually, you in contemporary roles, this rather sort of incisive, dynamic, uh, intense sort of person. Yes. Yes, I think that... that uh, it's true that, uh, that I give, I think I must give off a, a kind of, uh, of um, effect of being like a, a bristling and sharp-edged and uh, pointed, uh, or the kind of image you get from a, a porcupine or something, mm -hmm. that uh, while it's interesting and all that, it's dangerous. <laughs> don't come too close to something. I don't know. But I do have that that uh, characteristic, I suppose. I mean, one can't be objective about it, but it's, I understand what he means, that you have to... That I'm anything but disarming as a person. Yeah, because there was a report in the press on Friday about the considerable Oh, yes, 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 yes. Yes, um, first of all, the article, uh, is, is the newspaper is uh, going to print a retraction because half of the facts in it were absolutely cockeyed. Uh, and secondly, the uh, interpretation in the uh, piece was again distorted by um, certain elements which are now possibly sub judice because uh, a suit is being prepared against the newspaper and the reporter. It's funny you should have mentioned this about lawsuits. Is this because you feel this is going to be damaging to yourself or damaging to the actual, the whole country? Oh, it's not damaging to me. I mean, I don't mind uh, because this has been part of my image, you know, throughout that I'm uh, temperamental or that I'm tyrannical or whatever. I mean, that whether that's true or not true. Uh, what is true is that I make uh, very great demands on myself and on other people that work with me. I have uh, high expectations of what must be done, should be done, and how people should function. And if those expectations are not met, uh, then there is a, a lot of disappointment uh, all round. And uh, it's... Uh, I suppose that's difficult to live with, there's that kind of demand. But uh, 
So far as these individuals are concerned that were referred to, two of them um, were people who uh, were not employed by me, but merely by the Coventry Belgrade Theatre had come down to erect the production, which had come down from there, and they'd gone back in the normal way. Uh, two people were uh, uh, on a trial basis, a, a, a apprentice trial basis, uh, doing jobs uh, which were beyond their experience uh, and they were being tried in these positions and uh, the complexities of the responsibilities were so great that they were just not able to cope with them and so they left uh, because of that. One person left because of sympathy with one of those that was let go because they were great friends and felt he couldn't carry on. <coughs> Uh, the, the, so basically, that's how those people were listed there. Uh, but you see, we have a problem, which is a very difficult one in terms of staff and help and so on. First of all, we have uh, insufficient funds to do the, the amount of activity that we are uh, organizing. Um, how much money do you have? How much money? Yeah. How much money do you have for the actual theatre? Well, we 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 were given by John Players uh, twenty five thousand pounds last year, and twenty five thousand pounds this year, plus an additional ten thousand pounds, which covered a ten thousand pound deficit we had last year. So, our costs for the year are almost three times, for the season, are almost three times that. Therefore, we rely on our box office takings to make up the difference, you see. So the point what I'm making is that the problem we've got is that we have a limited season of 10 or 12 weeks. We can only give people employment uh, for that period of time. We cannot pay them the going rates or the, the competitive rates that they might be able to get elsewhere so that we have great difficulty getting staff of any quality or caliber uh, because obviously they don't want a short time job if they can get a long time job, long term job. Uh, they don't want a job that pays them less than they can get elsewhere. And so one, unfortunately, has to go into the area of people without sufficient experience to demand the kind of uh, uh, salaries that they could get if they had the experience. So we are taking a chance on giving people responsible jobs for which they've had little experience. Uh, and uh, casual labor, people who, <clears throat> like students who are looking for part-time work and so on, well, you can't obviously run as efficient an organization under those circumstances with that kind of personnel as you could if you could put them on a year-round uh, job and pay them decent salary. Well, until we get the kind of funds that a national theatre gets, which is nearly a million pounds a year, or the Royal Shakespeare Theatre, uh, it's unreasonable to expect that we could c compete and not have difficulties of administration organization. A remarkable thing uh, is that we are able to have accomplished all the things we've done under those circumstances. And, you know, it, it, instead of looking at it from that point of view and saying, my God, how was it possible with all these difficulties of funds and staff and ad hoc operation and having to erect a theater from the ground up and take it down uh, and to organize not only last year eight different companies coming in and several uh, Sunday night performances and to run the Shakespeare Film Festival and put up a cinema and run a museum and exhibitions and run a summer school and run exhibitions. How could you possibly have accomplished that with so little funds and in those circumstances? Instead of looking at it that way and seeing the miracle 
of achievement and administration that that's that really obviously uh, must be the case. So th th this article is an absolutely uh, dishonest, scurrilous, untruthful, um, destroying piece because it looks at it from the wrong end of the telescope, apart from not telling the truth and lying. How have the audiences uh, been this year? Have there been an increase on this? The, incre the increase is, uh, is quite substantial, not as much as we would have hoped. Uh, I think our problem too is the fact that we've got to overcome still of the uh, fact that this is not an area where people normally would come. I mean, if we were in the West End, there'd be no problem because you, you're in the heart of theatre land. Here you're in an area which has certain transportation difficulties. People don't know too much about it, um, partly because we haven't uh, the funds to do a proper advertising campaign, as we should. We can't advertise, for example, in all the papers that we'd like to, or in the way that we'd like to. We haven't got funds for large poster campaigns and all the things that the commercial theater and the national uh, and Royal Shakespeare are subsidized uh, to do. <coughs> uh, so we rely a lot on editorial comment, and if that isn't forthcoming sufficiently, then we, we are at a great disadvantage. And so we have to build up a word of mouth uh, uh, interest, and this can't be done overnight. It takes, it'll take two or three more years before we really establish this area uh, as we intend. And players have given have some <coughs> new assurance that the grants will be coming every year. The players' company uh, have a, a five-year option on their sponsorship for us, season to season. <coughs> and uh, we have been given every reason to believe that they would like to continue, that they're happy with what's happening, that their association with us is a benefit to them, as it is to us, because obviously they wouldn't be doing it if they didn't have some kind of benefit to them. And uh, we believe that it's a, quite a marvelous uh, effort on their part to uh, sponsor a cultural educational uh, event of this kind, uh, as well as the, the kind of things they do in the field of sport and other areas, music to a less extent. Why are you um, insisting that the globe should be open to the to the air, because surely, you know, in, since the Elizabethan time, there's so much more noise now, particularly overhead noise, that isn't this very distracting? For you, well, so? we're not insisting that it should be open to the sky. But at the moment, yes. <clears throat> Well, we couldn't erect a permanent structure that was so solid and then have to take it down again just for 12 weeks. The only kind of structure we could put up is a temporary structure. And that temporary structure is uh, the, the, the nature and design of it is in the control of GLC. I mean, if we if we had our brothers, as we say, we would have tried to put up at least a fully enclosed structure, like a tent, a fully enclosed tent. Uh, while that wouldn't have shut out the noise, at least it would have helped uh, produce a better, uh, a warmer atmosphere, shall we say, on a cool day. Uh, as it is, we. Uh, uh, are entirely in the hands of the GLC building department and architecture department with respect to what we can or cannot do, and they've insisted that it had to be an open-air style theater building. Uh, and apart from anything else, it, we couldn't have afforded, you see, to, to uh, build a, a more solid structure under the circumstances. We've only been given the use of those uh, of that site, which is a car park, for Twelve weeks. That's it. It isn't our property. How about the museum? Is that your property? The museum is our property. At least we have an option to purchase it, and we're in there uh, for three years with such an option. So that, to all intents and purposes, belongs to us. Just a matter of scraping together the the uh, funds to purchase it finally. But it is 
hours, uh, to all intents and purposes, yes. What exhibition is coming after the stews? Uh, after the stews of Bankside will be an exhibition called the, This Wooden O, based on uh, what the structure of the globe was and the controversy about it inside and out. There isn't much pictorial evidence of, of the dispute in the theatres. Well, there's quite a lot of pictorial evidence of the exterior of uh, the Elizabethan theatres, although they're highly questionable because they're in conflict with each other, and uh, many of them are uh, variations and interpretations that come down through the 18th and 19th, uh, 18th and 19th and 20th centuries, um, but they're all based on the original 16th, 17th century drawings, of which are, as I say, uh, not very clear and contradictory, in fact. The interior, but there's more of the exterior of the globe and the Elizabethan theaters, more evidence, that is, through these drawings than there is of the interior of an Elizabethan theater. There's only one drawing, actually, that exists, a contemporary drawing um, that was done uh, by an amateur uh, in a letter that he sent uh, home. He happened to have been the ambassador from Holland uh, who visited the Swan and drew a little picture on a letter he sent home. And that is the only known picture uh, of the interior of the globe, uh, or, or, or Elizabethan theater, rather, uh, in the late 16th century. So would you see this as being a sort of uh, drawback or an advantage in sort of planning when you eventually get the money for a real globe? Well, I don't, <coughs> I don't see what, whether it's neither a drawback or an advantage, uh, because I, while I'm no expert uh, on the building of a, of a globe or the history of it or the details of it, there are many, many scholars who have written books uh, on this subject who are, are advisors of, to the Trust on this. And in fact, in connection with this exhibition, This Wooden O, we are holding a second major conference on uh, what we uh, are expected to build, um, the decision of which will be taken at this conference by theatre scholars, educators, professionals uh, in the theatre, architects, and so on. Everybody will have a chance to have their say. And from this second conference, we've had one already in January of this year at the Festival Hall, and the consensus is that it will be a modern theatre uh, with the physical relationship similar to that of, a, uh, of the Globe or the Elizabethan theatre. Um, and with the exterior perhaps echoing mm -hmm. the... But, but no attempt to make an actual replica of the... I don't think that will be the final conclusion. No, I think the conclusion will be... <coughs> that ideally there should be two theatres, two buildings. One, a living contemporary concept of what the globe was like to permit contemporary productions to go on in them with all the facilities available to that type of theatre. And it'll be, it'll follow the style and type of an Elizabethan thrust stage and so forth. But the hope is that we can also build nearby as complete a reconstruction uh, 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 as is possible, which will be used as a museum and exhibition, permanent museum and exhibition, so that people can go through such a building and see what it was like, and even stage one or two scenes uh, to show, uh, give a demonstration of, of performances there. And uh, the backstage area will be as authentic as the is the, is the in an auditorium aspect. That would be the ideal situation, and that may very well happen. I mean, once this um, development takes place and the theater gets off the ground and is the area is attracting 
thousands of people to it year-round, uh, I think there will be then the, con the, 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 the uh, feeling that, uh, well, the atmosphere will be favorable to possibly thinking of doing that later on. I think it will be done, perhaps not in my lifetime, but I think there will be two theaters here. How much of a personal commitment is, is this for you? I mean, do you see yourself staying here for 10, 15 years? Oh, it's a lifetime personal commitment. I don't, and, uh, I don't see myself uh, being exclusively uh, involved with this project. I mean, I still want to and will be pursuing other aspects of my professional career as a producer, as a director, as an actor in opera, in films, in theater. Uh, but this is my base, this is my home, this is my hobby, my lifetime's ambition, fulfillment, uh, and I see that going on. Yes, I've made well, that kind of commitment. You haven't acted in quite a while, have you? No, I haven't. Was that through choice? Or? Yes, I've devoted, I said, the only way that this project could really happen is if I made a total commitment to it gave two or three years of my life to really seeing if it'll happen. And, I'm, and I was willing and able at that time to make that kind of commitment. To, what were you actually doing at the time you came up? Because you were I was directing a film. That was Catler, was it? No, I was directing a film called Kyle. I was preparing to direct a film yeah. called Kyle. Uh, and we were about to go off and shoot this picture in Canada when 20th Century Fox, the company uh, uh, producing the film, uh, had a, a crisis uh, and Daryl Zanuck and his son had a falling out and uh, several pictures were cancelled and this was one of them, several projects. And so it was at just at that point I had several months of my contract to finish out, so I was being paid anyway. Uh, not to work. If I had taken another job, I would have forfeited the remainder of my fee, which I was not prepared to do. And so I had the time and I had the money to, uh, subsidize, to subsidize myself in this uh, effort. Uh, and as it developed, I made the commitment not to take anything else that was going to interfere. I had a contract already to direct uh, Catlow, in which I couldn't uh, avoid, and uh, therefore went out to do that in the spring or summer of 1971. <laughs> That's it. And that was very difficult for me to, to leave this uh, during that period, but I employed somebody to hold the fort for me while I was away. The fort was where? Well, it was in my home, actually. Oh, yes. We had no office. Uh, yeah, you live in Hampstead, do you? I think we were in Highgate. Oh, okay. Yeah. Your daughter, I see, is here. Does she work? Oh, our youngest daughter yes. is here, yeah. Well, she's got, she's working around here. Just for the few weeks before she goes to Bristol, where she's going to goes to university there, she will be going there. But she's been uh, helping out and finally proved her worth, so that she's got a few bomb out of it. I think. <laughs> are, you a, are you a hard taskmaster to your daughter? Because usually they say daughters and sons. Are the worst well, I don't. Uh, the great thing with Jessica is that, so far as her relationship here is concerned, I don't have any responsibility for her. She is, uh, her boss is somebody down at the box office, and uh, my instructions are simply that, uh, uh, that uh, she be uh, treated exactly as any other person working here. And uh, they would set the rules for what she does or does not do. And she is responsible to them. And I have n uh, no control or do not interfere with her 
operations here at all, as I hope not to do with anybody else. I mean, the, uh, the thing is uh, there is a delegation of authority right down the line, and I hope that that works. It works to some extent. Anyway, she seems to be, my, the reports I've got, she seems to be very efficient at doing her job and not in danger of being fired. So the film Car was never actually made? Car was never made. Because yeah. actually it's in Who's Who, isn't it, as having been made? That's right, because yeah. it was, <laughs> it was put, uh, the way these things do, as you're working on a film, mm. which, you know, we worked seven months on it, so, obviously, my secretary must have put it in, one of my secretaries. Um, I get the impression from the films you've made that they were films which were offered to you, but you, you know, rather than you actually wanted to do them, something like this, you know, a melodramatic or western like that. Certain films uh, that I've done, and I haven't done all that many, I mean, both as an actor and, and director, were bread and butter films, you know, where you needed to function, uh, you know, and needed the income. And uh, one is in a position in this business of either being constantly in demand as an actor or as a director, or not. And if you're constantly in demand, you get a lot of things offered to you, and you can be uh, much more selective about what you do. On the other hand, if you're not being thrown a lot of jobs or offers of things to do, you either create projects of your own, which is much more satisfactory anyway, uh, or you, you may be forced on occasion to do things that you wouldn't normally have done. Now, I'm certainly uh, guilty of that. Uh, the only justification, of course, is, is uh, necessity. And secondly, then, the challenge is that much greater to do something or make something decent out of something that you would not normally have handled. Uh, it's a very interesting area, by the way, which in terms of press and uh, the kind of false uh, attitude that has to be built up around the people in this business, the glamorous aspect of it. It would be interesting to examine this area of where actors are held responsible for doing things or directors that are in a similar situation. And they've got to justify why they've done something on all kinds of intellectual grounds and why they chose to do this, that, and the other thing. Well, in fact, it's not a question of choice at all, a question of absolute downright necessity. And. Uh, it's not unlike somebody doing a job that he doesn't like to do, but he's got, he knows he's got to go out and do it because uh, he's got to feed his family. And when you reckon the fantastic proportion of un un unemployment uh, in this profession, acting, theater, films, all that, the entertainment profession, it must be true that some 90 or 95 percent of the people working in this profession go through this kind of experience constantly. And it's, you almost never see any examination of that and, or a, is there a recognition of that. It's always, you know, actors and theater people are always treated very glamorously and so on. Uh, because that's it, they've got to maintain that image, you see. I mean, and you, the, the press, have to maintain the image of glamour as well. And it has a certain glamorous, romantic character. The fact is, those people are struggling all the time. They're full of insecurities every step of the way, both financial and professional. Because your eldest daughter is probably facing this. She's just, 
she's appeared in two. My mid, she's my middle daughter. She's a middle daughter. Yeah. Zoe. Yeah. Uh, she appeared in two television programs, I think back to back. Yes. She? Now probably for her there'll be this long period now. I don't know if it will. But she, you know, she'll sort of have to wait a long time. But people naturally think, oh, you know, she's doing very well. Yes, I mean, we tried to dis my wife and I tried to dissuade her from going into the into this business because it's a very tough and heartbreaking business. You've got to be made of steel to withstand the tremendous wear and tear on the emotional system. I mean, apart from the natural talents that one might have, if one could go on pursuing and functioning one's, in one's career, you know, it's like an apprentice. You, you get you're given a job and you learn it. You keep, well, you learn it by doing it. Well, actors don't get the opportunity very often to keep, to keep doing the thing that they're trying to learn and to develop themselves in. And uh, it's all, that, that is the great problem. So you're going through this learning process all the time, uh, hoping to gain experience, but then you c very often can't get the jobs in order to gain the experience with. <laughs> so you're going through this, bath this constant uh, emotional upheaval where if you're not getting work your 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 ego is damaged your sense of security your sense of self uh, appreciation which is necessary in our in a profession you've got to maintain confidence in yourself and belief that you are capable of doing a job well and that you've got special talent of one kind or another because if you don't believe that, you might as well give up. But if you're not getting the, the opportunities to, to practice your craft because of the high degree of unemployment that exists, then you're constantly, you're, your emotional life is constantly being buffeted. Did you find this? Because when you came to England, you <coughs> seem to have been in one stage production after another. So it was one finish. <coughs> I've, been, I've been very lucky in my career. Uh, I have functioned, uh, I mean, not without difficulties and struggle and insecurities, but but having to do things or make things or make pro projects uh, when they weren't being found ready hand, ready ready made, so to speak, or at hand. Uh, but I've been one of the lucky ones. Uh, yeah. So, but as I say, not without very serious problems and. Uh, uh, throughout my career, I in exactly the same terms that I'm ex expressing to you. Now, if I've had so much success, if you like, in terms of continuity of work in my profession, uh, imagine what others that haven't had as much success as I have have gone through. If I've gone through a lot of strife and problem and insecurity and so on. It must be terrible wear and tear on the emotional system. Did your parents try and dissuade you from going to work? Not really, because they were absolutely bewildered by my involvement in it, and I had a very early success in my career. I mean, I started earning quite a lot of money when I was still in my teens through the medium of the soap opera uh, in radio. and. Uh, when that happened, naturally, while they, they, they had no aware that my family were never involved in the theater, they were so astonished that I was earning so much money at such an early age that uh, they had no reason to <laughs> object because they'd only considered a career for me in terms of a future security for me and my family, uh, or my future family. And uh, because I suddenly shot to the fore in terms of income and so on, they thought, well, fine. Uh, you know, they were rather pleased. And with that, there was a certain amount of publicity which rubbed off on them too, which they rather enjoyed. So there was never any objection. What was the soap opera? What did you play? Oh, God. There were several of them. Uh, uh, Chicago, where I, 
I was born and went to school and where I started functioning uh, was the center of radio soap opera in the 30s. And there were all kinds. There, there was, I mean, in fact, there is a program in television in America still on today that began its life as a radio program then in the 30s called Lone Journey and another one called Mary Marlin. <laughs> and my wife and I both uh, were on these programs. She was at drama school with me. She became very successful in the radio field and played starring parts on these programs. You were the, the young uh, son? Well, in these programs, oh, yes, I played, oh, I don't forget all kinds of parts. It, I, you know, played everything on radio. It didn't matter because it was just a voice. And uh, I, I was on a very famous program called The Goldbergs many years ago, which was one of the most successful programs ever. Um, with a, a woman by the name of Gertrude Berg, and I played one of the, uh, I married into the family, you see, mm -hmm. one of her daughters. But that sustained me in my early life, in my early professional life, remarkably well, and uh, allowed me to, to go on onto Broadway with some funds behind me. So I wasn't as panic-stricken as some of the other actors of my age and my generation. You didn't sign your films to that uh, the end of the forties, did you? That's right. Films. That's right. And you were what were you were Polish or Italian immigrant? Isn't it about immigrants? Oh, that film, I was a Central European immigrant, and I'm not sure whether it was like Poland or Czechoslovakia or Yugoslavia, one of those countries that it was all about the immigrant uh, problem in America in at the turn of the century, uh, before the First World War. And it was a comedy, of course. Yes. The following picture that I made was also about an immigrant, only it was a tragedy, you yes. see. Yes. Yeah. This, of course, is one of the last uh, so-called, uh, well, I mean, the masterpiece is perhaps too strong, but it's, it's a very famous film that perhaps no one has, has seen for about it, 15 that's years. That's right, yeah. Well, I, I would say that it was just short of a masterpiece. It was a, an almost great film. And uh, no doubt that it's a classic. The book is a classic. The film is a classic. And it exists, I believe, in the archives of the National Film Theatre here and in the archives of the Académie Française and in the Modern Museum archives but in America. Did you come over to England just to make the film? Or? Yes, I came over in the first instance just to make that film because it could not have been made in America. It was uh, at the time of the McCarthy uh, hysteria in, in the States. Uh, and the subject matter was critical of a period in American life. In fact, it's a film with the same character as *A Grapes of Wrath that John Ford made and uh, had the same critical attitude to a very terrible period in American life. And the uh, people making the film were under indictment by the McCarthy committee at that time and so there was no way they could get any American financing for the picture and they were able to find that financing here. It was very strange to make an American film in London and have to build a New York street in a London studio. Yeah. But then after Give Us This Day, um, you, your film career seemed to sort of degenerate. Was this because you did, you were so much identified with stage work because you were so successful on stage that people's film people didn't really think of you in terms of uh, no, parts. no, no, no. I think, uh, uh, let's face it, uh, the truth is that there was, because of this film, because of the McCarthy era, 
there was a total blacklist on people like myself uh, who were somehow tainted with left-wing or liberal views. I'd also made this picture, uh, which was a critical of certain aspects of America. The director of the film went to prison uh, uh, after being found guilty uh, 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 of contempt of Congress when he refused to answer questions at the McCarthy hearings, as a result of which I could not be employed in Hollywood. I could not be employed in television. Just because you'd be been that, in the film but, but, with these people? Partly that and partly because I espouse some of the causes that liberals and uh, like myself um, you know, supported in those days. We were anti-fascist, we were against the Franco regime and said so. We were uh, against the Hitler regime and said so. We were pro-Soviet in the sense that they were our allies in the war and said so. I think, you know, last time uh, I thought these statements were all made before I had a chance to look at them, and then they were presented to the committee. I thought rather wrong to do that without my having vetted them as well. And I think that uh, we're running into the same kind of situation. Well, time is effective. Yes, yeah. but I do think. Uh, well, I'll ask them to bring them into you. Well, I think yeah. so, because yeah. I, I think it's very wrong. A lot of those figures were not explained to me until afterwards. Uh, well, I assume because you got this. Well, it was done so hurriedly last yeah. time, wasn't it, that there just wasn't time to explain them. Uh, and as you may know, I had certain objections to the way they were put down subsequently. There was no projection of any potential income or anything like that. You know, uh, which... They're trying to do that as well. Yeah, yeah. All right, fine. Well, I'll, I'll talk to you. Thank you, Frank. This is the legal thing, is it? What's that? Is this the thing with the even standard? Oh, no, no, this is to do with, uh, with our own, uh, we're having a meeting of the executive board and we've got uh, a, uh, a financial report to produce, you see. No, that's all that is. Um, you were going to Australia tomorrow, right? Uh, Wednesday. Tomorrow? Yeah. Wednesday, yeah. How long ago did they ask you to actually direct this first production? Oh, this was a year and a half ago. Oh. Yeah, and uh, I <coughs> was so... I mean, uh, the idea had so intrigued me that uh, I thought, well, how the hell can I do this for the opera is uh, having done a couple, three operas before. I know how much time it takes, you see, and uh, the idea of leaving this project for that length of time uh, really wor worried me. But then I thought, well, this is a year and a half later. Uh, this would not be for a year and a half from now. And I, I was convinced that uh, in that time, we would have established a sufficiently strong organization and got enough sufficiently on our feet for me to go away and, and not be too worried about it. Um, and also, I, the opportunity was so exciting because I've been such a long time at admirer of this fabulous structure that I decided not to miss the chance of doing it. It's an incredible thing to have undertaken because I mean every I mean this production sort of really good, isn't it? Because I mean everyone's waiting and Oh yes. Oh I I'm you know up with years, it's an so. example, you see, of my approach to life, I suppose. And that is that any normal person in this field would look at that opportunity and say, oh my God, uh, however good it can be, however this, that, and the other, and exciting, the, the dangers are so great of damage to one's career if the thing isn't brought off that I'm not going to risk it. I, you know, throw caution to the winds, uh, if something like this excites me, okay, if it's a flop, it'll be damaging. Uh, if it isn't, marvelous. Uh, but I'm willing to take risks. I always have been willing to take risks with my career. And this is one of the reasons that people 
do see me in a rather different way. I mean, you know, people think of me as erratic, if you like, sometimes, or controversial, because I do take those kind of risks. I have believed in, I have a certain kind of vision, and if I believe in it passionately, then I will give as much passion to it as is necessary. Because I, you can't do anything halfway. You've really got to make a total commitment to something, and that's it. Um, to do this kind of project is immense. To propose it is foolhardy. But because I believed in it, because I know it's a practical thing, because I know it's in fact inevitable, given the right forces to put it before the public, then, uh, you know, I'll go full steam ahead, which is what I think has happened here. And what sort of resources are you going to have to marshal for war and peace? I mean, what sort of numbers? I mean, are you going to have huge, um, yeah, huge chorus? Well, the chorus will be no bigger than, uh, than uh, a good-sized chorus at Sadler's Wells or Covent Garden. Mm -hmm. and it might be less than that, in fact, because I just think the stage is not capable of, of taking as many people as that. Um, the orchestra is a full complement. Um, and the company is a very large company. Yeah. But I mean that, you see, the, having had the experience of directing films uh, and other operas, but I mean films where you have the great complexity of numbers of people and logistics and so on. I mean, it's not any great problem. It's a, it's a logistical problem, basically, of how you organize all that in a way that makes sense and uh, uh, comes out in some, with some aesthetic integrity. I don't know whether that'll happen. That's uh, but obviously people are expecting fireworks in this production, almost literally, with a you know, thing like one of these, about the battle scenes. And we know that it's very difficult, that kind of thing, isn't it? Because you, I don't want that to dwarf the actual you know, the person. Around. No, I think that the, all these things have been done in the theatre one way or another, you know. Uh, as I say, one way or another, it's a question of how you do them, uh, whether you do them with the, artistic sensibility or not. Uh, the Russians like to do all these spectacular scenes with with all the effects going, all the old-fashioned effects going, and uh, today we've got more modern effects, uh, and sometimes you see this in the theatre. Uh, but I think we've now learned that, uh, that uh, you can be much more effective in the theatre without all these sort of obvious corny effects. Hello. Which box? I never saw the toolbox, my love. No. And what after War and Peace? Well, I'm going uh, to via America to Australia to set up a production of Macbeth, the UNESCO mm -hmm. play, which we are going to co-present in the United States and on Broadway. And. Uh, uh, I will probably be directing it as well uh, for a number of reasons. I mean, Charles Marowitz is very much involved with uh, his open space and can't take the time. Uh, and uh, it's, I've been wanting, I love the play very much. I think it's, uh, it's a marvelous play. And uh, I've been wanting to do it myself, it's just that I haven't had time to do it in this season, and uh, as Charles had uh, translated and adapted it, uh, I asked him if he would direct, and he was delighted to do so. Are you, are you doing an actual um, non-touring production? I mean, non, uh, I mean, most of these productions have been brought in, haven't they, from our side this year, but you did? No, actually, we... The Twelfth Night, uh, we mounted, although it, a version of it was done in uh, the Gardner Center last year, 
the Macbeth production is our own production of, done with uh, the Belgrade Theatre Coventry. I mean, they used some of the members of their company there, and we cast the principals from London. So it was a, a joint production, really. And Antony and Cleopatra is entirely being done for here. So in fact, it's really three productions we've been responsible for, although, as I say, The Twelfth Night was done last year by the same director. Have you been disappointed by the critical response, particularly to last year's Hamlet, which was pretty negative? Well, I wasn't. No, I thought Hamlet got very excellent notices and did extremely well. And I think that, in fact, the notices on the whole for this season are, are, are much better than they were last season. Uh, we were, at, I mean, it was almost unanimous negative response to two or three of our productions last year. I mean, for example, the <coughs> Shoemaker's Holiday was, our opening production was uh, disastrously received by the press. Uh, and uh, The Man for All Seasons wasn't uh, too well received either. Uh, whereas this year we had excellent notices on the whole for the malcontent. We had the controversial press on Twelfth Night, but uh, three or four of the critics were you know, very la laudatory about that. And Macbeth, on the whole, has had marvelous notices, except for Harold Hobson and one or two other critics. But on the whole, the notices have been very, very good. How do you react to bad notices? Does it, you, you seem very calm. You seem to take things in your stride very easily. Well, I, you know, I think that this, the, the nature of what we're doing here is um, uh, so complex that if I were to be upset by one thing or another uh, in the scheme of things, uh, I wouldn't be able to carry on. One has to be able to take things in one stride. Naturally, I would have liked unanimous press notices. I would have loved it if every critic had said, you know, what a great uh, production this was unanimously, and that the booking office was, uh, you know, inundated with, uh, with applications for tickets and all that, because that would help to make the season a greater success. But I know that we are building our blocks one by one, and we're making a solid foundation, and thing is going on, and I can't expect us to have it smooth sailing all the way, particularly, as I say, as we don't have the resources, the finances, and the support uh, on the same basis that these other theatres that are given mammoth support. And therefore, while we have ultimate aspirations to be on the same level creatively as these other organizations, until we have the support financially to do that with, I think uh, nobody has a right to expect that of us at this point. Yeah, yeah. Well, I just finally said uh, what you'd really like. I mean, if you had your dramas, as you say, what, what would this place look like? Well, there would be a, a, a marvelous globe, new globe theater mm -hmm. rising on the very river front with a great terrace around it, with pubs and restaurants and museums and libraries and other places of interest for people to come. Uh, and that it, be, that it will be, uh, and that it be a, a, a great center for people to not only enjoy the historical associations of the area, uh, to enjoy the marvelous river and its view across the way, uh, but to partake of the delights of all the varied activities in the cultural, entertainment, and educational field that there will be offered to them around here. That's a big enough way to depollute the Thames right now. That's not my job. <laughs> That's one of the jobs I'm going to let somebody else handle. <laughs>